This week, Siskel and Ebert review Arnold Schwarzenegger stalking a deadly enemy in Predator. Bruce Willis battles terrorists in a Los Angeles high-rise in Die Hard. A young movie fan joining Arnold Schwarzenegger on screen in Last Action Hero. Rene Russo tries to catch a thief, Pierce Brosnan, in The Thomas Crown Affair. And Arnold Schwarzenegger talks about his new image for the 90s. Let's go, let's go. Hot town, summer in the city, back of my neck, getting dirty, Welcome to the party! What happened? I saw it. You saw what? I saw it. Arnold Schwarzenegger parachutes into the jungle on a political mission, but finds himself fighting a creature from outer space and Predator, one of the new movies we'll be reviewing this week. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Sisko of the Chicago Tribune. You will be frightened by nomads. Predator stars the muscle man with a smirk, Arnold Schwarzenegger, in a story that is part Rambo and part alien. And that's a tired mix for me. I'm personally tired of seeing a commando armed to the teeth battling a slimy, <laughs> extraterrestrial creature with a horrendous overbite. Typical of the all-too-familiar action in the film is when Schwarzenegger is sent to infiltrate an enemy village and rescue some Americans. Pure Rambo. Pure boredom, if you ask me. What the hell is he doing? That's just a Rambo-like setup for the real story, which is Arnold battling a mysterious force that hides among the trees and sees with heat-sensitive eyes and seemingly cannot be destroyed. I know one thing, Major. I drew down a fire straight at it, kept off 200 rounds in the minigun, full pack, nothing. Nothing on this earth could have lived. Not at that range. Jack, you take first watch, then you get some rest. Okay. Later, Arnold interrogates a Latin American woman. The dialogue only repeats the same tired theme. Yesterday, what did you see? You're wasting your time. No more games. I don't know what it was. It's... Go on. It changed colors, like the chameleon. It uses the jungle. What's your name? Anna. Anna, this thing is hunting us. All of us. I think you get the feeling you've seen this movie before, except, I must say, when the creature arrives. When the creature arrives, that's a little different in the beginning of the creature. But when you see the creature finally at the end of the picture, then you think you're seeing outtakes from the movie Aliens. As derivative as Predator is, though, it's not all bad, not by long shot. Schwarzenegger can be funny, and the creature, as I said, is a marvelous creation in its invisibility as it moves around and blends with the foliage. But the story is old hat. No, make that recent hat. Rambo mixed with aliens. Let me get this straight. You liked the creature as long as you couldn't see it. It was only when you could see it that you didn't like it. In its it. full, yes, in its full revelation. And you, I don't want to give away you too much of the movie. You enjoyed the early scenes in The Invisible Man, too. I did enjoy them. This, but yes, my imagination is more interesting than the reality. This movie, it. I think, is better than you're giving it credit for. It's a, it is exactly what it is. It is a pure summer <laughs> what is that? action picture. Yeah. It is two hours of excitement. They shot it on location in the jungle, which is a very effective... Uh, placed uh, a very effective yeah, a good environment place to, to prefer a jungle movie. No, but I mean they could have shot it on the back lot somewhere. This <laughs> looks and sounds right. It feels right. There's a lot of energy in it, and that's what it is. Of course, it's a cross between Aliens and Rambo. But so what? Well, the people the, the, who will enjoy this movie can't remember I last summer's movies. They probably can't I, remember last week's movie. Now come on. Forget the people. I don't care about the obviously people that are going to enjoy it. People. I don't enjoy it. I don't, I'm tired of this stuff, and that's all that I'm paid here to say. Okay, next movie. Our next movie is named Million Dollar Man. I shouldn't have been so hard on those. But what I'm trying to say is 
not that they couldn't remember the movies they'd seen last week, but that it's just, oh, it's just a Friday night entertainment. Yeah. It's very, very effective. Your, your standards are dropping. Your standards My are dropping. My standards are not dropping. Your standards Never are dropping. I can remember when I was in high school. That's a long time ago. Yes. When I was 14 years old, a girl wanted to break up with me. And you know what she told me? She said, she likes you. And the moment that I heard that, I just turned away to the one who did like me, you see, because I was such a pushover for the fact that I was being accepted. I think there's something of that in everybody at every age. But one of the most amazingly attractive things about a woman, Jean, is the fact that she likes you. Well, That, that makes would, her attractive. Well, Shows what good sense she has. Yes, I can't argue with that. Can't <laughs> argue with that at all. I don't know what that has to do with the movie, except that... We now know what happened to Roger at 14. Coming up next, Die Hard, with Bruce Willis up against a gang of crazy terrorists who have occupied a skyscraper. It stars Bruce Willis as an off-duty policeman who attends an office party in a Los Angeles skyscraper and is overlooked when terrorists occupy the building and round up all of the other people. Hiding out on a floor that's still under construction, he wages a one-man war against the bad guys and maintains radio contact with Reginald Vell Johnson as a cop down on the ground. I want you to find my wife. Don't ask me how. By then, you'll know how. Uh, I want you to tell her something. I want you to tell her that... Um... <laughs> Told her it took me a while to figure out uh, what a jerk I've been. The movie is filled with wall-to-wall -wall action, a lot of it based on the inability of the L.A. cops to believe that Willis himself is really a cop and not a tricky terrorist. Blow the roof. A car's up there! Blow the roof! I promise I'll never even think about going up in a tall building again. got just a glimpse there of the guy in the beard that's Alan Rickman who plays the villain and who's really the most interesting character in the movie kind of an intellectual uh, guy with delusions of superiority Die Hard has a lot of action scenes like the one on the roof so many of them you're amazed the skyscraper doesn't turn into the towering inferno they're dropping explosives down the elevator shaft and whole floors are being blown apart but you can also see there, I think, one of the big weaknesses of the movie, and that's the idiotic behavior of the Los Angeles Police Department. There was one character in this movie, a deputy chief, whose actions are so stupid and so unmotivated and wrong-headed that finally he just brings the movie to a stop every time he opens his mouth. Bad writing. He always says the wrong thing. He understands nothing. And with a movie like this, once you start picking out the loopholes, and there are a lot of them, it doesn't matter how good the stunts or the special effects are, or even how good Bruce Willis is. You just can't stay interested. I did stay interested because I saw this as really a mano a mano between Bruce Willis, who I think is very good in the film, and Alan Rickman, who is really quite devilish and quite sinister and threatening. And I also like the fact that it is held in the skyscraper, so there is some claustrophobia involving this terrorist, seeming terrorist attack. There's also a by-play relationship between Willis and his uh, woman, his former wife, and they want to get that going. She's one of the people that's being captured. But basically, I thought of two guys trapped in a tower trying to fight it out, and I bought the film. Well, what about all the cops on the ground? What about this deputy? But they stay Even away from them. They they stay away, after, they stay away from Willis him. Willis is brought down to the ground, yes. which is a miracle considering that all of the elevator well, shafts have been dynamited. I followed uh, him all the way through. Uh, the cop is standing there saying, we're going to bill you for all the damage you've caused. There I are mean, always... You groan at things There like are idiotic that. cops in the Dirty Harry movies, too, oh, when you no, laugh at them. I, the, uh, Come on, because Harry's this smarter. Is not an Willis idiotic, is, this is not an idiotic cop. This is idiotic writing no, to make no, a cop like this no. when it would have been better if he just pushed the action forward instead of constantly being wrong-headed. One supporting character, two very very interesting lead characters. I like the movie. Now. Tully, you're afraid of our fleet. Hmm? You should be. Personally, I give us one chance in three. Sean Connery plays the commander of a super-secret Soviet nuclear submarine that both the Russians and the Americans want to capture in the hunt 
for Red October. Our first movie is The Hunt for Red October, and this is a slick, intelligent, well-constructed movie version of the best-selling novel by Tom Clancy. Set in the Cold War year of 1984, it tells the story of a renegade Soviet submarine skipper played by Sean Connery, who devises a scheme to defect to the United States and bring the latest Soviet submarine right along with him. Connery's plot begins when he murders the Communist Party political official who is on board as part of a system of checks and balances. I want you and the doctor to witness this. I'm removing the political officer's missile key. Carry on. And I'm keeping it myself. Captain, I, I think we should report this to Red Fleet Command. I'm afraid that's impossible, Doctor. Our orders are for strict radio silence. Order, sir. That's all logging off. Yes, sir. This is most unnerving, Captain. The reason for having two missile keys is so that no one man may... May what? May arm the missile. Meanwhile, an American intelligence expert, played by Alec Baldwin, is convinced that Connery is trying to defect with the submarine. Here he meets with James Earl Jones, a Navy Admiral, to explain his theory. Good afternoon, Admiral. Good afternoon, Matthew. Where are we going, anyway? Briefing for Jeffrey Pelt, President's National Security Advisor. Most of the Joint Chiefs will be there, along with a few other people. Who's given the briefing? You are. Beneath the sea in the submarine Red October, Connery justifies his plan to the men he trusts. You had to make a political statement. Or was it something deeper, Captain? Something that made you unable to simply slip away? Was it ego, Captain? We each have our reasons, Victor. Huh? My own began the day I was handed the blueprints for this ship. A ship which had but one use. Desperate to prove his point, Baldwin, the American intelligence man, has himself flown to a rendezvous with an American sub that's near the Red October. Okay, back she goes. And then he tries to convince the American sub skipper, played by Scott Glenn, not to attack Red October. The Russians will stop at nothing to prevent Ramius from defecting. They are desperate. They've invented this story that he's crazy because they need our help to sink him before he can safely contact us. Weapons control, I want full safeties. We're so close. I want those fish coming back at us. Full safety, I, sir. Captain, I know this man. In movies like this where you have a lot of different cast members, a little typecasting helps out a lot. And the performances of Connery, Baldwin, and Glenn provide a strong center to the film. What's also a little surprising is how easy the plot is to follow. If you've read Tom Clancy's book, as I have, you may remember what a complex plot it had. In the movie, everything is clear as crystal, and that helps the suspense a lot. There's one strange contradiction about the movie, though. They've done a great job of reproducing the insides of submarines in this movie. They look absolutely authentic, to me anyway, having never been in a submarine. <laughs> but the underwater shots of the outsides of the subs are sort of murky and disappointing. I don't know, maybe nuclear submarines just plain look like big, bloated, gray whales, and there's nothing you can do to make them look any sexier. Have you been on the outside of a submarine? Uh, I actually, I, I down at the Museum of Science and Industry, I, but that was a German U-2 boat from World War II, so yeah, I think it's not they, exactly up to date. I think they probably got both parts right. I think that the insides of the submarine, all that stuff, this is a good how-to movie. Mm -hmm. I think we learn how people operate on a submarine at the same time. I think that what's interesting is we also learn how the intelligence community works. Uh, particularly in the United States, there's a great political meeting mm -hmm. with all the admirals, the joint chiefs, mm -hmm. and a political operative mm -hmm. uh, for the president. Uh, and it's very well done. And we think we're on the inside, which is the appeal, I understand, of Clancy's books. The other thing that I think is really distinctive about the film is the performance by Alec Baldwin. This mm -hmm. is sort of a star-making role. He is, he, he is not uh, a superhero. He doesn't play it that way. He plays it as a guy who's simply very, very smart and careful and methodical. He isn't boring while doing that, and I thought that was really the strength of the it film. It was good casting, and it was interesting for that particular role that it was a relatively new face. We've seen him before, yes. but a lot of people don't know who he is. Yes, in other words, if it were a familiar face, for example, if you put Connery in that uh -huh. role, you say, well, there's not going to be any problem here, because he'll obviously solve what needs so to be it, solved. So it has this in common with the book. It's a smart thriller. In other words, it congratulates you for being smart enough to be able to figure out 
all the stuff that's going on yeah, here, and it's a, fun on that level. A lot too. of extra yeah. information. The next film is called Medicine Man, and this is a real disaster. It stars Sean Connery as a biochemist who has discovered a cure for cancer in the Brazilian rainforest, and Lorraine Bracco as the feisty head of the foundation that underwrites his work. She goes to South America to check up on Connery, who's been living in the jungle for six years, and to make this serious material palatable for a mass audience, the filmmakers have decided to make them a quarreling movie couple, like when they first spot each other in the jungle. This is from Ornega. How about a place to sleep? Ornega? You're from Ashton. He sent you? I tell you, they sent a girl. He sent a girl? Yes. <laughs> I'm not a girl. The hell you're not. I'm your research assistant. The hell you are. Why is she so instantly angry? It makes no sense. The script does Bracco no favors as she maintains her aggression constantly in the picture, as in this scene where Connery tells her he must prove his mettle by fighting the local medicine man. He's three feet tall, for sake. You wanted to pick his brains? Not off the sidewalk. The only time Medicine Man works is when Connery and Bracco's feuding is dwarfed by the natural landscape. The tall trees, which may contain the cancer cure, make everyone still and quiet. I really like those moments with the pulleys and moving up and down in the trees, but then it's quickly back to earth and back to the banter as Medicine Man turns into a would-be romancing the stone with its quarreling uh, couple. Medicine Man also illustrates another persistent problem in the way women are treated in the movies. We get these accomplished woman characters now. Here we have a biochemist, okay. She's not just the daughter of the neighboring uh, explorer around, you know, like we, in the old Tarzan pictures. But then what happens? She turns into a standard female ninny when she's faced with a real man, Connery. And that's offensive, too. You know, there was one other thing that made me angry, and I agree with everything you said up until this point, and that is that the crucial clue for this anti-cancer serum, which is totally missed by Connery and by Bracco, is completely obvious to the audience the first time it's introduced, and then later on, the second time it's introduced. And these scientists out there in the jungle, these Nobel biochemists, are busy trying to figure out oh. something that everybody in the audience has known for half an hour. It's really, it's so obvious, it's frustrating. Well, that's because you're watching it as a movie, and, the, and, and, to, and they're in the... If yeah, you but follow. that's their excuse. Okay. What's the filmmaker's excuse? Well, right. Since the filmmaker is going to make it clear okay. to... At first, and I don't want to give away the plot, right. but the fact is, if you're writing this script, wouldn't you have scientists bright enough to realize that they may not have isolated the precise okay. ingredient right. that they needed. You're just picking on a small well, thing. Well, but if you sit for half an hour saying, how okay. stupid can they get, that's not okay. small. I'm just saying, why? Her character is... Yeah, well, you're right Lorraine about that. Bracco you're has right. been yeah. good in so many different mm -hmm. pictures. Why do this to her? And, of course, she should insist not to read those kinds of lines. Okay. Well, it probably sounded like the kind of movie that had all kinds of neat elements in it. That's, you know, uh, it attracted me as an idea, just not as a movie. The next movie on my list of the year's worst films also featured a big-name star, and in this case, there was real disappointment because Sean Connery is usually fun to watch in almost any role, but he sure wasn't fun in Medicine Man. The movie had the elements of a fascinating story about an eccentric scientist in the South American rainforest who discovers a cure for cancer, but that wasn't enough, and they had to go and turn it into a package of cliches about relationships. A woman scientist, played by Lorraine Bracco, turns up to oversee his work, and before long, they're fighting like Dagwood and Blondie. They sent a girl. They sent a girl? Yes. <laughs> I'm not a girl. The hell you're not. I'm your research assistant. The hell you are. That's formula stuff. Another problem with Medicine Man is that it didn't think the audience was very smart. When Connery finds and then loses the secret of his cancer cure, every single member of the audience knows immediately what his mistake was, what he did wrong, what he should do next. But it takes him the rest of the movie to figure it out. Now, I don't know about you, Gene, but in movies about scientists, I like it to be at least as smart as the people in the audience. Well, I think that the biggest problem is the bickering that you talked about. Because, you know, here, and this is, again, a, a real slam on women. They have a woman scientist. All right, now, you have to be pretty smart to be a scientist. Why does she turn into a ninny down in the jungle? Mm -hmm. Because it's Sean Connery, I guess. And so they bicker, and it is silly. And the reason why we would go to see this film, frankly, the only reason to see the film is because the trees are beautiful. The and trees that's and that little hammock arrangement yes. they have for flying around. The rest is ridiculous. Uh, do it. Do it. 
Joanne. Box office star in the world, but maybe the top promotion expert, too. His new multi-million dollar thriller, Last Action Hero, was still being edited last month as he arrived at the Cannes Film Festival, but he showed the coming attractions to the assembled press and then embarked on a non-stop series of interviews about the movie. This is one of the brief scenes the press scrutinized before talking to Arnold. Hi. Schwarzenegger, whose violent R-rated Terminator 2 was a giant hit, said his new movie would qualify for the PG-13 rating and present a kinder, gentler Arnold in a movie aimed at a broader family audience. We always intended to shoot the movie for a PG audience. It was always from the beginning on a, a fantasy movie of, of epic proportions, a movie that does not dwell on violence, much more on action and it, uh, on adventure. In popular films like The Terminator, I'll be back. And Total Recall, If I'm not me, who the hell am I? Schwarzenegger has killed an estimated 275 people on the screen. But that was the Arnold of the 80s. Now here's the Arnold of the 90s. I think that the, the 80s were quite different than the 90s uh, will be. I think that in the 80s, we made much more, in general, much more hardcore movies. I think The Terminator, for instance, was a true representation of the 80s and of uh, what kind of movies the people wanted to see. I think the 90s are different. I think in the 90s, we want to see a kinder and gentler type of an action hero. Uh, we want to see an action hero that shows m more vulnerabilities, that is more multidimensional, that shows kind of uh, love and affection, all kinds of other elements, but at the same time be tough and try to, to, to wipe out evil and to do all the big stunts and all those other kind of things. But I think that in Last Action Hero, we redefine the action hero of the 80s. Last Action Hero is a movie within a movie about a kid from the audience, Schwarzenegger's biggest fan, who discovers himself somehow inside the same reality as his movie hero. Holy cow! I'm in the movie! Ah! Who the hell are you? Don't shoot me! I'm Danny Madigan! I'm a kid! Hi, it's that guy. The boys? The corner phrase. The bad puns? The hard walk? This is really happening! One reason Schwarzenegger is emphasizing the PG-13 rating may be recent studies allegedly showing that on the average, family films outgross R-rated films at the box office. There are some questions about those statistics, but never mind, nobody has outgrossed Arnold, no matter what the rating was. Although at the dawn of his career, he seemed like an unlikely candidate for movie stardom, he has been consistently brilliant at finding the right roles and the right stories for himself, and now the $70 million budget of Last Action Hero is his bet that the tide is turning toward lower key action. It'll be interesting to see if he's right. So we're getting Arnold light, if you will. Yeah, no, right. no light was stripping the fat out of foods and yeah. all this sort of thing. Uh, I do feel the same mood in the country. I, when I was watching the latest Sharon Stone picture, mm -hmm. I thought, you know, this is just too negative and downbeat. I think he may actually be on something. No, it's something. interesting because I had lunch along with a dozen other movie critics with Jeff yeah. Katzenberg, the head of the Disney Studios yeah. at Cannes, and he said, Disney has already anticipated that this trend has come and gone and is <laughs> aiming for the movies that will come after it. So that's the way. They're always living 18 months yes. in the future out there. I guess there. they've got to. Can you hear this? Help me! Get me out of here! My God! This man's not dead! <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger pokes fun at himself and his larger-than-life stunt-filled movies in Last Action Hero. And our first film is Last Action Hero, and this is a most ambitious project that works quite well in fits and starts and then drags on for what seemed to me like an extra 30 minutes wearing out its welcome. It's a movie within a movie within a movie, movie about a young boy who is addicted to Arnold Schwarzenegger action pictures, and he ends up landing right inside one. Here's the scene where it all happens. <laughs> Um, yep.
That's Austin O'Brien, quite good and relaxed as the kid. They become cop partners, and the banter here is a lot better than that Burt Reynolds monstrosity, cop and a half. The joke here, Schwarzenegger's character naturally doesn't realize he's in a movie. He thinks he's real. You don't understand. You just solved the entire case. You just revolutionized the entire history of police training. I mean, all these years at the academy, studying human character, psyche of the terrorist, fingerprint analysis, all the courses that I've taken in surveillance, hostage negotiation, in criminal psychology. I mean, all I had to do is just drive around the neighborhood and point my finger at the house and say, the bad guys are in there. Together, they both chase movie mobsters here atop a hotel for a mob funeral. And this is where the film starts to get a little long, even though the stunt work is impressive. Otis, don't shoot! You will drop Leo! The ultimate villain in the piece is a mobster played by Charles Dance, who late in the picture takes over the kid's ability to jump between the movie world and the real world. That was for blowing up my second cousin Frank's house. And this is for blowing up my ex-wife's house. But this, this is for my daughter's black eye! Usually when I do that, it leaves a hole. As I watched Last Action Hero, I thought of a line written by film critic Vincent Canby at least a decade ago, that with the homogenization of the American film industry, with escalating budgets and safe subjects, we were heading toward a time when, in a manner of speaking, there would be just one movie made in a year. And Last Action Hero could be that film. It has the number one movie star doing his thing and also commenting on it at the same time. Ultimately, he seems like he wants to get onto new territory, and so do we. I enjoyed chunks of Last Action Hero, but culturally, I think it may be more significant than it is entertaining. I was also disappointed in it, Gene, and also, like you, I was impressed by some of the stunt work, but then again, you can kind of manufacture stunts. The tricky part is to put them in a movie that is worth watching for two hours and keeps your interest. And here, I think one of the problems was this duality, because the, the suspense scenes, when you're supposed to be really wrapped up in them, you are all undercut by the knowledge that it's the movie within the movie, and so something is going to happen uh, in such a way that what you're seeing isn't really what is going to be the payoff. I don't yeah. know if I made no, that no, clear, no, no, but what the you're point saying is, is yeah. that the movie constantly confuses you on that level of emotional involvement. No, what it does is it sets up a pattern that you know is going to be kept on yeah, going, right. and so that when it's tense, you know it's going to be uncut. Uh, what I think they should have done is had it be more bookend introductions and let the action go straight through, or have the kid talk that might have and, and have yeah. a rooting interest where the ki where he's really trying to help the kid, not joking with each other so much. The one thing that I liked somewhat was the way they kid the action was cliches. Good. For example, the talking killer, yes. which we've talked about on this show. That was smart. Okay. Bruce Willis, Jeremy Irons, Samuel L. Jackson. Congratulations. You're still alive. Yippee-ki-yay, mother... In a John McTiernan film, Die Hard with a Vengeance. What's your take for this? 5% of the value recovered. Oh. Bounty hunter. If you like. Always get your man? Mm-hmm. Think you'll get me? Oh, I hope so. Pierce Brosnan plays a zillionaire who amuses himself by stealing a painting worth $100 million in The Thomas Crown Affair, a romantic thriller that goes for elegance rather than excitement. Rene Russo co-stars as the insurance company investigator who's sure he took the painting, because after all, he just about tells her that he did. So the only question is, would she rather catch him or fall in love with him? Do you want to dance? Or do you want to dance? Dennis Leary plays a police detective who thinks Russo was poaching on his case and moving way too fast. You compromised the investigation? No, I jump-started. Oh, really? What do you have to show for it? Sorry to the date. Things are also moving maybe too quickly between the cat and the mouse as Thomas Crown determines to seduce this woman. He'd rather have her than the painting. Now you're going to take the stick. Oh, I'm not taking it. Take the stick. I'm not taking it. Put your hands on the stick. Oh, no. The Thomas Crown affair was great to look at, and at times I enjoyed the laid-back amusement with which the actors approached their characters, but I never really bought them as passionate people. I remember the 1968 version of this film, directed by Norman Jewison, with Steve McQueen as a gentleman bank robber and Faye Dunaway as the woman on his trail. And I thought that one had a little more magnetism between the actors. Rene Russo has generated electricity in movies like In the Line of Fire with Clint Eastwood, but here 
she and Brosnan both seem more interested in the game they're playing than they are in one another. I don't know, Roger. I liked it more than you did, for one thing. And I think one of the things I liked about it was the fact that these are two middle-aged people who, at the, in, their, in the state of their middle-agedness, have nothing better to do because A, they're so wealthy, and B, you know, they're so fabulous, mm -hmm. that they're miserable. And they've gotten, they want to sort of maybe come together and settle down. Um, and they see each other as an opportunity to do that, and the fact that they happen to be on opposite sides of the same case is, well, is now, kind Wesley, of the angle I mean, I know that it's, you're not going to be middle-aged for a long time, but it's not like they're completely well, without resources. Here's no, I mean, a but, guy who lives the most opulent lifestyle in history and steals $100 million for bored. entertainment. He's stealing them because he's bored. He's well, but he's not bored because he's stealing them. That's how he entertains well, himself, I mean, and I she is very interested in the fact that, that she's trying to outsmart him and at right. the same time playing around with risks that she's taking with her heart. This right. is not just middle-aged people looking for a substitute for golf. Well, I mean, no, not ultimately, but I mean, I think that's one of the motivating factors that, like, when you said they're not passionate people about each no, other. No, they, they aren't in this I movie, think that, no. I think they're settling for something, and I'm not, that's not the most romantic option, but I think it's really practical for this movie. Well, I think the movie um, would have worked better if you really thought that they wanted to sleep with each other, and it seems to me that the way the movie plays, they're more interested in this game that they're playing than they right. are in Which really, I thought in was the more reward. interesting than, than the Norman Jewison version. I thought the, the really cool thing about that movie was the way it looked. Okay. And this is really, really super stylized, which I think is great, too. And John McTiernan, director of Die Hard. <laughs> the 13th Warrior. Another wretched remake was John McTiernan's version of Rollerball, first made in 1975 by Norman Jewison. The movie stars a real mixed cast. Chris Klein, Jean Reno, LL Cool J, and Rebecca Roman Stamos, and is set in a Central Asian Republic where Reno dreams of establishing his deadly new sport and making millions by selling it to American cable television. The integrity of the game must be maintained for the people to keep their heroes alive. And to keep them gambling, of course. There's one slight problem. The sport is so deadly that it can never develop any stars because they get killed in every match. And so incoherent is this movie that no one in the movie is ever able to explain the sport. Well, I think Rollerball is the most disappointing of these movies because I like the original from the 70s with James Caan, but because it's like about a techno sport, because it's set in the future, you'd think with better technology, better special effects, something like this could be updated and could be an improvement, but they go wrong at every turn with this Their thing. Their set looks as cheesy as the original roller derby set, and did anybody in devising the sport wonder if there would be a problem since the track yeah. does a figure eight so the people would have a lot of crashes well, right about here it ain't no quidditch is it okay coming up next you want to see what happens when you lie what are you doing when you lie john travolta and samuel jackson were unforgettable in pulp fiction and they're both in basic too but this is a military mess i wish i could forget dylan you son of a bitch